and I'm going to get uh, my. Hold on. There we are. Now we've got this recording and we've got both recordings. So you'll have both the phone recording and you'll have the audio record recording. So whichever one works will be what gets posted on YouTube. Do you want do you want the slides or the I'll keep the slides going so I just uh, click No, this. but what are you trying to record? Are you trying to record Just the slides cuz you have it, the camera pointed oh, at the crap. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, there we are. That'll do it. All right. Now we can begin, I guess. So, slide one. Uh, introduction. Today we'll be covering the domestication and the breeding history of apples. Basically how we got from wild apples growing in the Kazakhstan forest to what we have right now. Well, as mentioned right now, they're domesticated in Kazakhstan, but the main breeding efforts occurred primarily in Persia. Kazakhstan the apples were acquired by the Persian Empire, and within that realm, they intermixed with other apple species, specifically Malus orientalis. Malus orientalis has more of a donut-shaped feature, which can still be found in certain apple varieties. Uh, afterwards, they got moved to Rome, and from there they mixed in with European species of crab apple, like Malus sylvestris, which you probably won't get, find around here, and Malus baccata, which you will find around here as a common uh, ornamental crab apple variety and species. So, can you interrupt? Uh, save the questions for near the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. That's fine. All right. It's also within this region that the primordial rootstocks were formed, like all the M series, like uh, M9, M M26, and so on and so forth, or direct lineal descendants of what was bred in Persia. So that's pretty cool. After a little bit of time during the Renaissance, several founders, founder populations became apparent. Apple fries that became the Genghis Khan's of well, apples, being the, the progenitor of a great many apples. And you'll start with the Genghis Khan of Genghis Khan's, Renet Singh Tong. Wait for it a little bit later. Renet Singh Tong gave rise to Renet French. Now, get used to this name, you'll be hearing it a lot. This is the ancestor of 50% of all domesticated apple varieties you know of. One five. It's in the pedigree of a very many of them. Some of the more common ones you'll see around here in the Heirloom Collection, you can get them in Canada right here, would be White and Pippin. Uh, hold on. Fit, uh, Darcy Spice, North Rosemary Russet, and some others. Uh, not all of them are as directly you know, descendants of, Ren of Renette French, but many of them are. And uh, we'll continue. But just to put a fine point on it, uh, Rosemary Russa, keep that in mind, they'll be important later. By the way, all these varieties are resistant to fire blight if you're interested in that sort of thing. Alright, this is uh, Renette de Carnes. This is a French apple, and it's the ancestor of a great many French apples. It crossbred with Renette the French, again, and uh, gave rise to Renette Holland alongside many other cultivars. And Renette Holland gave rise to a great many cultivars all across France and many parts of Europe, and a few in Australia as well. The co most common ones you'll find around here in uh, Heirloom Nurseries would be Adams Paramain, 
a direct sibling of Renette the Holland and King of the Pippins, which is also known as Runny Russet around here. You can actually get him at uh, St. Jacob's Farmer's Market every so often. And now we go on to Margill. Margill has been uh, utilized in a few apples. One of their descendants is very important, and you'll be learning about it in the next slide. But this is a French apple of unknown origin. This is one of the progenitor apples. All the apples I mentioned before seem to be derived directly from the ancient Roman apples and may date back to Rome. Markle derivatives. Cox Orange Pippin and Ripson Pippin. Now, Cox Orange Pippin is a direct descendant of both Margill and Rosemary Rusted, making it both a descendant of Margill and Renette the French. Ripson Pippin is also descendant from Renette the French. Through a different lineage, of course. Can't remember it off the, cannot remember it off the top of my head, but it is what it is. Now we talk about Alexander. Alexander is a really cold hardy apple, and it's a Russian apple, and it's the cold hardiness. It's in the ancestry of a small number of varieties, but they're good varieties. Dr. Oldenburg, not to be confused with, not to be confused with, uh, Duchess of Oldenburg, which will come later. Gascon Scarlet is another one, and Cox Pomona is yet another one. These varieties are relatively cold hardy for what they are, but there's other varieties such as Wolf River, which are extremely cold hardy. Most of them are cooking apples. This brings us to Red Astrachan. Red Astrachan is another Russian cultivar. It became it became popular it became popular within North America during the during trade during the 1800s, if I remember correctly. This is another progenitor variety. This is from uh, ancient Rome, probably. It's been utilized in in the pedigree of most of the Eastern Europe and Northern European varieties is in the pedigree of most of the Swedish varieties, a good chunk of the Russian varieties, a good chunk of the Kazakhstani varieties, and even a bunch of the Belarusian varieties. These are really major varieties right here. Around here you will find, the most common ones you'll find will be the Russian variety called white or yellow transparent, they're the same cultivar, just different names, and Akiro, which is a lineal descendant of Red Astrachan. One of the problems with the Red Astrachan and its descendants, however, is this. They don't last very long, they're a uh, couple day long apples. They're ready, they're ripe, you eat them, and if you don't, in a couple days they're really un unappetizing. Good for cider. Good for, good for cider though. Okay. Alexander is a similar deal. Uh, most of them are not really edible off the tree, but they do become, make good eating apples. This brings us to the Golden Renette. But first we have to go back a little bit. Remember these names, this will come up a little bit later. Oh yeah, Cox Pomona is actually descended from a combination of uh, another heirloom apple that's never really gotten anywhere, but it's really cool nonetheless. Golden Harvey is also combined with Renette Carms and Renette French and Alexander. But back to this. This is Golden Renette. This is another ancient apple of likely Roman origin. This is an uh, apple that's not been used very widely, but has given rise to a few distinguished cultivars that have been major in the UK and France. This is Blenheim Orange, a, a direct lineal scent of 
Bread of the Holland and Golden Renette. Orleans Renette is another example. The bloodline of Golden Renette is that they're kind of, if grown in the wrong environment, they're mealy. If it's grown in the right environment, they're melty. Melty in your mouth sort of thing. So if, so, uh, I've had uh, both of these. They both taste pretty good, but they're mealy in Ontario, so not to be recommended, but still pretty good. Now this is a variety you'll never get your hands on, but it's still a cool Roman variety. Golden Pippin, it's one of the very few cultivars of apple that's known for the densely fruity flavor. There's only about five varieties that I, that I know of that have this flavor profile. I can only name two off the top of my head, Golden Harvey and Golden Pippin. Uh, most of its descendants are found only in the UK, but it's been utilized in making a lot of cider apples in the UK. But uh, one of the apples that does you can find around here is called Pitmaston Pineapple, and yes, it does taste like pineapple. Ooh. I can just uh, scream back here a little bit. Uh, Pitmaston Pineapple, when you cross free of other stuff, creates progeny that are resistant to fire blight. So mm -hmm. that's always a good thing. Good for breeding. Uh, which brings us to the next one. Another pineapple flavored apple. Ananas Renette. Ananas Renette is a pineapple flavored apple. And it's been utilized in a small number of cultivars. Mostly in German, Germany. Mm. But you can still get one around here. Dr. Oldenburg is a hybrid between Alexander and Ananas Renette. So this is pretty good. And now we get into modern times. In the modern era, there's been a big shrinkage of the gene pool. Before 1930, 41% before 1930, 41% of all apple cultivars in the 20th century had at least one of the founding of five founding cultivars in their pedigree. These would be Macintosh, Jonathan, Golden Delicious, Cox Orange Pippin, and what's the last one? Bread Delicious. Oh, you did say Golden. 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 But anyways, uh, since, uh, since, the nine, since the 70s, no, since the four, from 1940 to 1960, this increased to 74% of all apples being sent from these five cultivars and stabilized at 73% afterwards. So, 3%. 43% 73. Why? No clue. I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I've looked it up for quite some time, but uh, I have no answer for that. <laughs> but uh, this brings us to where we are right now. We can start with... Uh, Red, we can start with the wine sap. The wine sap is uh, one of the smaller foundational cultivars. It was utilized only in bringing two varieties, but one of those varieties was Red Delicious. Red, Deli Red Delicious was bred originally as a wild seedling found in a field by a, of an Iowa farmer. And went through many name changes from from uh, Starking to Starking Delicious to no, wait, from Hawkeye to Stark and Delicious to Red Delicious. It's in the pedigree of 30%, 36% of the Pacific Rim countries, that would be like uh, Japan, China, and whatnot. And 22% of all United States cultivars.
Now we move on to Grimes Golden. Grimes Golden was crossbred with Renette de France to give rise to Golden Delicious. Golden Delicious has currently been bred in into many different varieties, specifically 36% of the Western European apples and 18% of the United States apples. And, uh, and 55% of the modern apples overall have Golden Delicious in this pedigree within Japan, China, and Australia. Which brings us to the next one. Jonathan. Jonathan is the representative of Esselsberg Spitzenberg. I may have mispronounced it, but it is what it is. And that cultivar is a direct descendant of, you guessed it, Renette de French. Told ya. The origins of this name vary depending on who tells it. One school thought suggests that it was named after the leader of the Albany Horticultural Society, Jonathan Hasbrook. Another suggests that it was named after Rachel Pickley's husband, Jonathan. <laughs> but either way, it's in the pedigree of 26% of the Western European cultivars and 25% or one fourth of United States cultivars. One of the key cultivars that came out of the, the constant breeding with Jonathan was Wealthy, which we'll be discussing tangentially near the end. But now onto Cox Orange Pippin. As mentioned before, Cox Orange Pippin is a crossbreed between Margill and Rosemary Russet, and is in the pedigree of a great many apples. It's in the pedigree of 48% of the British apples and 30% of the Western European apples. It's also in the pedigree of Gala. The Gala was made by crossbreeding Kids Orange Red with Golden Delicious. Kids Orange Red was made by crossbreeding Red Delicious and Cox Orange Pippin. So it has all three of the founders in this pedigree. And when we get into the PRI program, where we get Gold Rush, uh, Crimson Crisp, and whatnot, we get even more inbred because they crossbreed half siblings with full siblings, parents with offspring, and so on and so forth. So, uh, very, very inbred with as time goes on. So sorry. And this brings us to the next one. This is the Macintosh on screen. The direct ancestor of the Macintosh was the apple called Snow or Famous. And the origin of Snow remains mostly unknown, but uh, it was it one of the seedlings was uh, St. Lawrence, and another seedling that popped out of it was the Macintosh. The Macintosh is a hybrid between the snow apple and a hybrid between the uh, pie apple and something else. Now, the, uh, you can tell it has a pie pedigree in it because the uh, pie has a very refreshing flavor and very crunchy, while the snow apple is very sweet and caramelly but very soft and mealy. Well, the Macintosh is in 57% of all apples bred in Canada. No surprise right there. And in the United States, about 29.5% of the cultivars have Mac pedigree. In Eastern Europe, about 27% of the cultivars are partially derived from the Macintosh. In the rest of the world, it's less than 1%. Which brings us to another variety. Duchess of Oldenburg. The Duchess of Oldenburg was bred in Russia and was among the many Russian cultivars released to the general public, more specifically the United States, during the 1800s uh, trade between the United States and Russia before things fell apart. Now, uh, Dutch's Wollenberg has been utilized in a great many crossbreed efforts. 
is the stud plant behind most of the varieties in the Minnesota breeding program. Honeycrisp, for instance, is made by crossbreeding Frostbite and an, a cauliflower with no name but a lot of numbers behind it. The, the former is a hybrid between Duchess of Oldenburg, another cauliflower I can't remember the name of off the top of my head, and an unknown parent. <laughs> And the air parent is a uh, golden delicious crossbred with uh, Duchess of Oldenburg. So they're quasi half siblings. Frostbite was then crossbred with uh, Northern Spy to create both Keepsake and Sweet 16. Keepsake was crossbred with that unnamed cultivar to make uh, honey crisp. Then there's Wealthy. Wealthy is made by crossbreeding Dutch of the Wolvenberg with, uh, with Jonathan to create Wealthy. And Wealthy was crossbred with a whole whack of stuff to create uh, a bunch of uh, Minnesotan cultivars. Harlson, for instance, is a combination of the apple of Melinda and Wealthy. In Canada, we've also crossbred quite a bit with Wealthy. Uh, first, though, is an example of a cultivar made by crossbreeding uh, Wealthy with Northern Spy. But long and the short of it is, this has been another Genghis Kong right here. They crossbred Wealthy with everything to create a wide array of different cultivars, both in Quebec and in Minnesota. But then we have to give the Saskatoon because keep Harlson in mind because that becomes a major theme in Saskatoon breeding. In Saskatoon, they need cold hardy cultivars and well, Duchess of Oldenburg, extremely cold hardy right there. Surprisingly, it's also resistant to fire blight, but that's not in the sources, so ignore that, I guess. That's important. But, uh, it's been crossbred with a wide array of different crab apples in Saskatoon. Brooklyn was made by crossbreeding Harlson and Hare 12, which is a crab apple. Another crab apple called Rescue was crossbred with uh, Harlson to make September Ruby. And a good chunk of the cultivars also have wealthy in their pedigree in Saskatoon as well through Harlson. So the key takeaways right here is this is a there's this, there's a smaller number of cultivars in modern breeding than there were back in the day. There's even a number of uh, smaller lineages of apples that uh, I was going to get into but then we get into a couple hours. <laughs> And a lot more tangential stuff. One of the key, one of the interesting things is that, uh, hold on. If you see right here, rosemary rust hit is, it passes on resistance to most of, it, to fire blight, to most of its pedigree. And depending on who you ask, it's also scab resistant. Uh, in terms of scab resistance, I've seen papers that say yes and papers that say no, so your mileage may vary, but they do pass on fire blight resistance. Rosemary Russet does. But uh, here's the thing, Cox Orange Pippin, not resistant at all. It's susceptible to most things, in fact. Yeah. It probably inherits that from Margo, which is most definitely fire blight susceptible. But uh, when you crossbreed this virus stuff, you can actually increase fire blight resistance depending on which parent you breed it with. There's nothing written about fire blight resistance there because no one's written about it. Same thing with this, although I can make some estimations. That's for a little different talk at a different time. 
And uh, these two, there are some writings that suggest that these two are both fire blight resistant, and both of them are confirmed to be scab resistant by multiple sources. So these are a good sh shot right here. Uh, I've seen mixed reviews on fire blight resistance when it comes to Blenheim Orange and Orleans Runette, so your mileage may vary right there. But both seem to be scab resistant. Golden Pippin, I don't know because no one's written about it for a couple centuries and it's only available in the UK, so I can't really talk about it. Now, uh, now Pippin and Pineapple is susceptible to fire blight, but its progeny isn't. So, that's a little weirdness right there. And if for another little bit of weirdness, uh, Jonathan, yeah, we can get back to that. Jonathan is subtle to fire blight, but when you, when you crossbreed with a compatible parent, like say, uh, Duchess of Oldenburg or Red Delicious, you wind up with a resistant strain. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can send you the sources, but they're not listed here. I just realized I had extra time, so now I'm talking about some more stuff. <laughs> Have you, are you, have you heard of the um, Algoma apple project? No, I haven't heard of the album of Algoma. Yeah, because up in Algoma, which is sort of northern Ontario, they have the master gardeners there, they've been quite involved in a, an apple project, so looking at old apples mm -hmm. breeds, probably because of, you know, as you found in your studies that so many of the apples that we eat today are so inbred and they yeah. have a very limited gene pool. Yeah. And so apparently in Algoma they've been looking, they've been trying to preserve some of the older breeds of apples that might have a, a bigger range of genetics in them. Mm -hmm. So you might want to look that up if yes. you're so interested in the genetics of the... Yes. Now if I want to give you some advice on how to breed in the future, uh, I would use uh, these guys. Maybe crossbreeding with something a bit more long, a little bit more uh, long lived in terms of storability. Storage, yeah. Storage. Yeah. And maybe check it out, take a look at how things go because no one's written about their scab resistance or fire play resistance, well, ever, so you have to deal with that. Uh, Dr. Oldenburg and Gascon Scarlet and Cox. Pomona are very genetically diverse populations. If you cross, they also have Alexander pedigree, so if you cross breed that with something called Hardy, that should amplify the already pre existing traits. And the key thing is, uh, this is not in the sources because I didn't expect to get this done so quickly and talk about our stuff, but uh, if you see right, if, well, if you read the papers I'll send, I guess I'll be sending you later on. Uh, Dr. Oldenburg is a hybrid between Alexander and Ananas Renette, and both of them have the gene, have the genetic region called GE8019. And this region contains a lot of genes for fire blood resistance, and both of them contain that same region. So this one has it. And Cox Pomona has uh, Renette French, Alexander, and Renette the Carms in his pedigree, as well as Golden Harvey. There isn't much written about Golden Harvey. The only, s and mainly because there hasn't been much written about it for a few for a few centuries now. The most I know is that there is one web page that suggests a scab resistant. So Cox is potentially scab resistant and fire blight resistant, as is Dr. and Dr. Bo Oldenburg is almost definitely it. And Gascon Scarlet is a hybrid between uh, Cornish Aromatic, which has been used in a sm very small number of cultivars that you'll never see around here. But you will see Cornish Aromatic around here, just no none of its progeny, except for Gascon Scarlet and Alexander. But this variety right here, good, apparently it's a good cooker, and it's possibly fire blight resistant. 
Brandon, are you okay to take some questions now? Yeah, okay. and that's, yeah, I think that's enough okay. kayfabing right now, so <laughs> take a sip and... So those, those briefs that you're talking about, are they available here? Easily available? Yeah, you can get them from BC Nurseries. I ordered a few from a B, from BC Nurseries, uh, Salt Spring Nurseries, which is incidentally where I got a decent chunk of of the pictures from. Okay. But there's also a spot in in Northern Ontario, uh, in O'Keefe Grange in uh, Bruce County. They do sell a fair amount of varieties. Uh, you can get uh, Dr. Oldenburg and. I'm not sure about Cox Pomona, but you may be able to get, for, but you'll definitely be able to get Cox Pomona from uh, Salt Spring Nursery, uh, and as well as Gascon Scarlet. You will be able to get Cox Orange Pippin and Ripson Pippin from uh, from basically both of those spots, but I would recommend either of them because they're very susceptible to fire blight. If you want to get Cox Orange Pippin, you can get uh, Kids Orange Red, same flavor but more durable. Uh, and you can get them from both locations as well. So In, can you say those names again? It was Blue Springs Nursery? Salt Spring Nursery. Salt, Salt Springs? Salt Spring Nursery and, uh, O'Keefe Grange. O'Keefe. Okay. Uh, you can get both of these in both nurseries. Uh, you can get, uh, Wacken Pippin from uh, Salt Spring. You can get uh, Autumn Paramane from Salt, Salt Spring as well. Uh, you can't really get uh, most of these anywhere, but you can get Darcy Spice, which is all another descendant of uh, Renette French as well. You can get Northwestern Greening. I heard some rumors of it being a descendant of Alexander, but I don't have anything to confirm or deny that, so I'm not talking about it. So Brandon, how do you, like you spoke a lot about lineage, how is that determined? This is determined through genetic, uh, testing? genetic testing, mostly through uh, SNP markers, which are a genetic marker technology that allows you to scan a spot for a specific region and specific unique regions to compare one region to another. So basically, you get the oldest variety you can get your hands on, you scan for a bunch of different regions that are unique amongst all cultivars, and then you scan each individual cultivar to see if they share, how many, to see how many of these regions that they share. Okay. And you can sort of determine grandparent, parent, etc., etc. Okay. So, so for our purposes, our question would be, from the public, is, what, we, what can we plant that's a gold heart, cold hardy and as much disease resistant as you can get? This is the kind of questions that we get. Depends on the diseases you're looking at and how cold hardy you want to look at. Take for instance Duchess of Oldenburg. I've heard mixed reviews when it comes to scab, but Duchess of Oldenburg and most of its descendants are resistant to fire blight. Yeah, yeah they're cold hardy. Sure. And very cold hard, they're Russian. Okay. <laughs> Anything Russian, cold hardy. <laughs> <laughs> if it's from Sweden, it's cold hardy. If it's from Russia, it's cold hardy. Basically, if it's the same from the Duchess of Oldenburg or, or Kira or Alexander, Alexander, nine times out of ten, it'll be cold hardy. And these three are very cold hardy because. So, but we, they, most people would be looking at what's in a nursery. What's that grown? A lot, a lot of that would be like Macintosh bush. If you want to go for cold hardy and disease resistant, there is a, a, one of the varieties that came out of the Minnesota breeding program. I should have remembered this, but uh, I'm going to tell you now. It's a. Uh, what's the name? Chestnut crab. Chestnut crab is a hybrid between wealthy. And that's the name of an apple? Yeah, it's <laughs> a hybrid between. Uh, Wealthy, which is has the Duchess of Oldenburg in it, no surprise there. And the other parent is a hybrid between probably some crab apple, likely a Siberian crab apple, and uh, Kenswick and the Kenswick codlin, which is a cooking apple that's also known for its cold hardiness. So that's it. So a lot of these cold waters that you're talking about 
Like those would be where you would buy them from a specialty nursery for yeah. If you, on. Cause if you say like there's a lot of apple growers around here, if you if, and they don't have, they, you know, they have things like Honeycrisp, Ambrosia, Gala, Spartan, Pink Lady. Uh, what about those? Uh, Honeycrisp is fire blood resistant and partially scab resistant. Pink Lady is susceptible to both. Interesting. I can, I can verify that. I can verify that online. And it's not a very good producer. Yeah. Uh, uh, it turns, produces every other year. Yeah. Oh, this year it has zero, last year it was full. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're, you may, you may also get some of the PR, uh, PRI cultivars like Red Free or Jonah Free or something like that. Those are extremely empress, so I wouldn't really recommend most of them, but there's one I can recommend if you can find it. It's called Priscilla. It's the least inbred of these, Ooh. and it's fire blight resistant, and partially, and scab resistant temporarily. The reason why I say- Scab isn't a big problem, though, and people don't like the look of it. The reason why I say scab resistant temporarily is because the gene they use is a one gene trait, and one gene traits have a shelf life of three to eight years. So after the tree's that old, it, it loses its... No, that's how long it takes for the for the fungus to develop a way to overcome it. Yeah, okay, yeah, but that, yeah, okay. And so. that means that uh, the entire cultivar is no longer usable across the board. It's game over for that cultivar. Yeah, yeah. So, and what about like Gamma and Fuji? Fuji? Uh, Fuji is susceptible to fire blight. And scab and gallus susceptible to fire blight and scab because gold yes. is susceptible to fire blight and scab. Uh -huh. And guess what half of its pedigree is? Which is interesting because those are like the common yeah. apple yeah. that you buy. Or even if you go to a nursery that has apple trees for the home gardener, they tend to be those popular. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, three out of the five uh, major cultivars are susceptible to at least one of the diseases. Yeah. Uh, Cogsworth Goodman is susceptible to basically everything. Uh, Macintosh is susceptible to fire, blight, and scab. Wow. Uh, so is uh, Golden Delicious. Jonathan is susceptible to fire, blight, and scab unless you cross breed with something else. Uh, Red Delicious is supple to, to scab to a certain degree, but it's resistant to fire blight, depending on, stri on the strain, of course. Uh, so really, like people, if they want to grow apples, they should be looking for some of these breeds that you're talking about. Yeah. If, you're, if you want to grow f fire blight resistant apples, you need to venture beyond the common nursery, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go to OP range. Yeah. Or is it called? Yeah. yeah. Where is, is it? It's, uh, you know, it's in Bruce it's County. Uh, it's off of Highway 3 when you go to Savo Beach, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's a, uh, usually they have in September, or no, on October, they have a, uh, on the long weekend, on Thanksgiving, they generally have an open house. Mm -hmm. And you get, they have, I think, 300, to maybe even more, 500. Uh, varieties of apples. They're all old style varieties. You can order your tree for 60 bucks usually mm -hmm. and then you pick it up the next year. You go and try them out generally. Um, oh, but road trip. Go, go, <laughs> yeah. 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 That's so, not bad for it. I, I, would, I would say people should, uh, if you have a tree, try something brand new. Mm -hmm. So that will uh, give you know, if, if something happens to the Red Delicious and it dies out, and it does, it has happened, right, Brandon? Yeah, these these things do happen because uh, people grow the heck out of it. And there's a very specific type of disease that can really do it in. I, if I remember correctly, it's cedar apple rust. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's a lovely thing. And it's also prone to mold core because the flowers don't close all the way oh. at night. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh -huh. There is a there is a small fruit tree nursery near me called Silver Green. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you can get a few of those varieties from there yes. as well. Actually, I think you can get a hero from there. Yeah. That's just um, just outside of Wellesley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 ye
Yeah. But I haven't really checked out what briefs they have. Like what yeah. well, they have a, they, they have a pretty comprehensive list on their website. So. Yes, uh, you can get a fair amount of uh, the aforementioned Minnesota and Saskatoon varieties over there as well. Carlson is a really good fire blight resistant variety, and it's also scab resistant, from what I've heard. So positive right there. Just not crab is is resistant to basically everything, so it's durable to everything. Oh, and tastes. It tastes like chestnut mm. when it's fully ripe. When it's not fully ripe, it tastes like hawk's orange pippin, apparently. Okay. Uh, and uh, but the problem is, hence named crab apple, it's crab apple size. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> yes. But hey, it's still pretty good. So all these things like. Pakistan, at the beginning, how far back does that go? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but a few thousands. thousands. thousands Because you're talking about like Persians, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, so there's always been some sort of a wild crab apple or something in you know, all sorts of different countries. Surprisingly, the regular, the Kazakhstani apple has, is the same, same size as the old heirloom apples, but... Uh, We've been breeding for larger varieties, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, we only have a small n- number of cultivars, because those cultivars are, have very specific traits. Uh, yeah, that's once just like roses, like everything else. They they're, to... they're bulky, they store long, they're big, they're brightly colored, and they have no russets. And let's see, what else do we have? Oh yeah, and they... And when you crossbreed them, you you get very predictable predictable results. I would love to go to Kazakhstan and see yeah. an yeah. apple because they yeah. they actually sprawl, right? So they're not upright. Oh, they're more like, okay. They're more like bushes. Yeah. Okay. So easier to pick for the for yeah. The well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the whole thing about a small garden. You. Yeah. And you want to choose to stay small. So what about in North America? So does North America have like? Crab apples here, or do all the apples in North America come from? Most of the apples in North America, except for the except for Malasphora bunda, which is only really cold hardy to the most southern parts of Ontario and BC. Outside of that, they come from Europe. Mostly, they come from uh, Siberia. Okay. Siberian crab apple crossbred our stuff is the primary source of all our crab apple stuff. Is it? All our crab articles are either Siberian crab apple cure blooded or Siberian crab apple crossbred with something else. There's actually there is a, a wonderful lore about Johnny Appleseed who yeah. was mm-hmm. was an actual person. His name yeah. is John Chapman, and he's credited with popularizing the apple in the United States. And then, yeah, um, the whole yeah, so, yeah. So he, just, he traveled by canoe and he would distribute the apples. Most of them were made into cider. Because one of the things about apples is they don't breed true, right? So you've got five seeds, and you'll get five different <laughs> apples. apples. Yeah. yeah. So, so people made it into cider. So, you know, Johnny Appleseed was actually distributing alcoholic beverages across. <laughs> <laughs> no, whatever. Free yeah, free yeah. alcohol. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that okay. yeah. actually reminds me. Uh, just a quick uh, mo- note. Uh, most of the pedigree work has been done in European apples. There's very little known of the pedigree of our North American apples. Like, one of my favorite apples that each O'Keefe Range is a smokehouse apple. It tastes awesome. Uh, it's... Smokehouse. Yeah, it's, it's delicious. The name's, its namesake uh, comes from the fact that it was found growing next to a smokehouse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, makes sense. Uh, it's a really cool apple. Uh, nobody knows the pedigree of it because it has nobody's done any genetic testing of it. Uh, just the nature of the beast, and there hasn't been any testing re- regarding its fire blood resistance. Most. Some sources I've seen say it's resistant to fire blight, some sources say it's susceptible, so your mileage may vary once again. But uh, overall, it's susceptible to scab, so that's the only thing you got to worry about. But it is uh, resistant to mildew. It is resistant to mildew. Well, that's a good thing. Yes, you have a lot of rain. That's fantastic. Well, now I want to 
Because I want to ask my friend who's part of the Algoma Pastor Garden, because she's really involved in that yeah. project. I'm just like, I don't she know might what, have to I don't know anything about that, but they, I'm wondering where, what the genetics of those apples are that they're yeah. interested in. Yeah. If you're really interested in breeding for cold hardiness, Russian and Pennsylvanian apples are like your best bet because that's where the cold hardy stuff comes from, Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania is in the States. Yeah. Oh, okay. and, and Russia. Well, I guess the Pennsylvania brought the apples from Russia or wherever. Yeah. Right? yeah. A good chunk of them came from Russia as well. Yeah. They could have, yeah. Well, they came from Russia. Yeah. But uh, Russia is uh, very much a cold hardy location. If I was to do a breeding program and breed the cold hardy variety, what I would do first would be, I'd be using a Dolgo, which is a more recent crab apple variety made in Russia. A Siberian crab apple that's been bred to be edible. I'll cross that with a uh, rose marrow resident right there. Then I would, then I would take uh, some cross breeding work with combined Antonoveka, which has been used in, uh, which is one of the primordial uh, Russian varieties. They don't taste very good, and when you and when you collect seeds, they reproduce true to type, but. I would take the pollen from that and use it to uh, cross-pollinate that with red astrochan to hopefully get something that isn't true to type, but has storage ability of it and the scab resistance of Antonoveca. Then I would take that hybrid and crossbreed it with uh, Rosemary Russet and then crossbreed that with September Ruby. I guess you'd have to live a long time. <laughs> that sounds like a 20 year experiment to do so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, if you have all of them, then it wouldn't be too far. And if you have the right rootstock, you can shrink down. That's yeah. that's the thing too about three years per generation. Oh, oh that's wow. true. That's true. Yeah. So we can go from a twenty-year project to a nine-year project. Yeah. That's so, so yeah, because you look at most apples are grafted onto a rootstock. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the B nine rootstock is actually a pretty good rootstock for fireby resistance. Uh, Oh, I'm getting way off the sources on the screens, <laughs> and I'm just going off of what what going off of previous sources I use in different uh, videos and air talks and a little rambling and the book itself. So I have a question for you: How did you get interested in apple breeding? Well, I it started off in Richtown. I I went to Richtown as for the first years. To the agricultural college. Yeah, and uh, I took a fruit production course and during one of the projects was to pitch an idea for uh, for an agricultural product. Uh, in this case it was an app that the idea was pitching was an app for uh, heirloom cultivars basically. And uh, as I looked into it I realized the sheer amount of genetic variation within apples and I learned about how much our gene pool has shrunken. Yes. Well, so, yeah. And that's and I want to reverse that. Yeah, I think that's a problem with a lot of food that we eat. Well, bananas, like another like broccoli, cauliflower, <laughs> so many of the vegetables are very limited in their genetics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, because of uh, the F1 hybrid system. What you do is you inbreed a variety by portions of self pollinate uh, twelve times in a row. Then you get one inbred line, you do that with another lineage, 12 times in a row, another inbred line, and you crossbreed them and you get an F1 hybrid. This has a vigor of uh, actual normal plant, but uh, with the genetic uniformity of a very inbred line, because they're all siblings. Of yeah. ver- and then, and makes it in belt pattern because you need both inbred lines to recreate it. So as long as the owner has both of those inbred lines and doesn't allow anybody else to have them, they've got an inbuilt patent without having to do any legal work, and they've got a way of producing uh, varieties that have uh, the vigor of a normally normal crossbreed variety and uh, variability of uh, of something that's been inbred twelve times in a row. Yeah. So doesn't that make it susceptible to all kinds of... Yeah. Technically, yes. <laughs> they rely mostly on one gene traits and to overcome that. 
Uh, it's mostly lots of vigor, which you regain through that uh, crossbreeding the two inbred lines, but you have the variability of it, which means that once that uh, resistance is overcome, that entire cult of arsenal is sort of defunct, and you can't use it anymore. But luckily for us, uh, thanks to the current breeding systems, you can get new cultivar pumps out every year. Oh, yeah. And all the old defunct cultivars get sold in nurseries. Oh. So where does the new one get sold? New ones get sold on commercial to commercial oh. commercial greenhouses, commercial okay. farmers, okay. and all the old stuff that nobody really cares about gets shunted off to nurseries. So, which is the general public? Which is the general public? So I would recommend you go for an heirloom. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's how I got my pink lady. Um, Brandon said, "Oh, that one is not good." And then I got a cherry tree. Like it, it is really good at producing, but they are so susceptible to mold. Yeah, that's because in more recent years they've figured out a way to mute, make a mutated variety. That self pollinates, so most of our varieties are descended from once again inbreeding. Yes. Isn't that fun? Not only that, this one it, it flowers. It, it's a beautiful cherry, flowers, and very you know huge amount of flowers, huge amount of cherries. But it leaves behind. It's not bred so that it doesn't lose its. Uh, flower stalk, it stays on, and that flower stalk, like, I don't know what to call it, it's these leaflets of the flowers, the they stay on the, 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 this, um, branch of the fruit, you know. And, yeah, that's a product and of inbreeding. And the mold goes right there. Mm. Yeah, that's a product of... It all the cherries. Yeah, that's oh, a product yeah. of inbreeding. Yeah. Yeah. That's a product of inbreeding, uh... And, and that's why I don't want to go anymore. Yeah, there's a reason why they they cross pollinate. They if you inbreed, problems happen. But they found a way to make them self pollinate by finding a mutant variety and cross breeding that trait into other varieties. And now and now most of our stuff is descended from 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 self pollinate rice, which means that they pollinated it themselves. So they screw themselves quite literally. <laughs> And that's uh, why we have a lot more trouble with cherries mm -hmm. and a lot more trouble with good chunks of crops. Stuff that was not meant to be, not meant to self pollinate, was made to self pollinate. Mm -hmm. And stuff that was not meant to cross breed with their offspring or siblings was made to cross breed with their offspring and siblings. Mm -hmm. That's the, uh, and that's the main issue with our, our current fruit breeding system. It is what it is, Seems and we've got to reverse that. Yeah, interesting. Especially, like, you guys are just talking about plants, but there is all the cattle, like the cows. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Siblings upon siblings upon siblings. Right? Yeah, I have heard some horror stories. Uh, one of the major horror stories I've heard uh, was... Uh, was one of my classmates when I was in my University of Guelph years where they sort of, uh, where they, where, where one of my classmates actually took their dam and made it into her sire. Basically they took the father and made it to a daughter. And that's disturbing. And I can, and you can see the inbreeding in the Holstein cattle if you walk across it because, uh, I did walk around Holsteins is part of the Richtown experience, and there's definitely nothing going on in those in those lies anymore. Googly eyes, <laughs> and yeah, stirring. A lot, a lot of interesting. Mm -hmm. But well, thank you, Brandon. We really problem. appreciate your presentation. That was very oh, insightful, problem. very interesting. Yeah.